All right, good morning to everyone. Now, um, the purpose of today is to basically have a quick run through of all of our content. Um, I'll be going faster than usual um, because it's just a brush over. If you need me to stop and repeat something, let me know. Clear? Good. Um, you will get break, you will get lunch, so don't worry about that. 10 o'clock we have a meeting downstairs, so you can get a 10 minutes break for that. And um, you can get your lunch and so on. So we're trying to do a whole day, um, of course. We can see... <laughs> see, see what the children insinuated? Good. So let's get a start. So very important for you to understand is the basics of a computer. It always comes in um, the CSEC exam. They always test you on that, especially. One of these interested. I think the rest come in late. Like no, but it's business. And then some children. But then, watch but some, some, but there's a lot of science and tech that don't write away. Yeah. Good. So, um, for CSEC, they test you a lot on the basics of a computer. So that's basically chapter one, chapter two, three, all the way up to chapter four of this textbook here. So the very first chapter, the fundamentals of hardware and software. What do you need to know? You need to be clear, have a clear understanding as to what is the definition of a computer? How does a computer work? So a computer, um, the basic definition is that it's an electronic device operating under the control of instructions stored in its memory. So let me erase this part here. Um, an electronic device operating under the control of instructions stored in its memory. So those are the key points there in the definition. So an electronic device meaning what? Science students, tech students? Using electricity, basically that. An electronic device using electricity. Now, why the definition has electricity is because a computer does not need to be electrical. Does anybody know what's the first computer? The very first computer is actually an abacus. Ah. Well, that's an electric one. So. Abacus. Yes. This here is the very first computer. Because what basically is a computer? A computer is basically something that computes, something that tries to calculate something, something that tries to process something. So it doesn't have to be electrical, doesn't have to be digital in order to process something. Because when you process on your fingers, you're basically computing, right? So that's basically like you're operating as a computer. So but we digitize everything. We use electricity. We use electronics because it makes it what? Easier, faster, more effective. Because that's what we want to do. So that's why we, our computers are electronic. Now, the computer operates by following instructions. So like if I tell you stand up, I tell you sit down, you go home, you might tell you sweep the house. That's instructions there. Now, so... The computer has all the hardware components. Now, in order for it, the hardware, to know what to do, you have to tell it what to do. That's the instruction. So it's like your body parts. Your hand doesn't know what to do unless you got some sort of medical problem and then it's flinging all over the place. But your hand doesn't know what to do. You have to tell your hand to move, right? So you have to give your hand instructions. Similarly, the computer, you have to give it instructions. What gives the computer instructions? The person is using it, but more so, what is we running on the computer? The programs. the programs. So the programs have the instructions. The programs have the code inside of it. They can tell it add two plus two, add three and four and whatever the case may be. So yes, you are going to give the instructions, but you're giving the instructions to maybe a program, to a software, and that's what it's going to be. And then the CPU now is going to carry out that instruction. So. 
the other part there now is the memory. The memory is where the instruction is going to be stored. So just like how you have a brain, that's where your instructions are stored. The computer has a memory, and that is where the instruction is going to be stored. What is the name of this memory here? RAM. RAM. So memory has three names, basically, and you need to remember all three. It's RAM, main memory, and memory. We can get into all of these parts later on, but just for you to understand the definition. RAM has three names, um, RAM, main memory, and memory. They can use any one on the exam paper. Now, so to go over the definition once again, it follows instructions, the computer follows instructions that you put inside of the memory, which is the RAM of your computer. So that's why when you buy a computer, you go for the higher RAM, right? The 12 gig RAM, the eight gig RAM, because you want more instructions stored inside of the memory, right? Now when you open a big program, there's a lot of instructions inside of that program. So in order to fit it inside of the, um, the computer, in order for it to process it, you need more memory in order to store all that instruction. Especially more so when you open a lot of programs. When you open enough programs, the computer don't slow down. That's because you're filling up the memory. And when you fill up the memory, it's gonna move slow because it doesn't have any free space. It's like your phone. When your phone um, it runs out of free space, runs out of storage, doesn't it start moving slow? Yeah, you get messages, yeah, but it starts moving slower. Yeah, it's kind of use certain services and app and so on. So, similarly, any device, whether it's RAM, whether if it's um, storage, any form of storage, there must be some form of free storage in order for it to work properly. So when you fill it up, that's when it slows down. That could be a question, even a question in your paper. Why a system slows down when you have eight gigabytes of RAM and you open in a program that takes up six gigabytes or seven gigabytes or something like that. So it's for you to understand that um, instructions is stored inside of this memory. If you fill up the memory, computer is gonna move slow. The instructions are stored in the memory so that it goes to the CPU. Now I'm gonna draw a simple diagram for you to understand this concept here. So we ha the computer has what is called a motherboard, right? A board inside of the computer. Yes. So every computer has a board inside of it, an electronic board, a circuit board. And we call that in a computer the motherboard. In other electronics, you could even call it a motherboard also. So this motherboard here now, it has the most basic layout is to have a CPU, memory, so this here is your RAM or your memory, and then you're going to have down here a connection to your hard drive. Good. Sorry. Yeah. Turn off the AC. Come over the side. It's over your hot. Um, just move from under the um <laughs> Yes. So the hard drive. That's where you store all of your data, right? You store all your program in it, you store all your pictures, your games, um, the videos. Now, so it's gonna be on this hard drive here. Now, when your computer, when you open a video, when you open a game, when you install a game, it's going to be on the hard drive. All that data is on the hard drive, all the time. Because the hard drive is what we call permanent storage. So now, in order for your computer now to process that data, you open the game, you play the video, the computer has to process everything. Anything you're doing, the computer has to process it because it doesn't know, that's how the only way it's gonna know what to do. So what the computer is gonna do is that the data has to go to the CPU, but it does not go directly to the CPU. It has to first go inside of the RAM. Hence the definition, the instructions are stored inside of the memory. 
Clear? Good. So all of your data, if it's a video you're opening, a picture you're opening, in order for it to be processed, in order for the instructions to be processed, has to go inside of the memory, which is the RAM. Then the CPU now is going to collect it from the RAM. So data is going to just be going back and forth between the CPU and the RAM. So whenever the CPU wants to process something, checks the RAM, see what is there, processes it, carries out the instructions, send back the information to the RAM, and that it goes like that back and forth. So that is the definition of a computer. The computer takes the instruction, puts it inside of RAM, inside of memory, and the CPU now is going to process whatever is inside of RAM. Yes, question? That's the hard drive. The SSD is solid state drive. Solid state drive. We can get so it to. Uh, the same sentence where it says the, um, the CPU depends on the RAM? Does not depend upon the RAM, but in order to get instructions. In, in more technical, when you go higher in, um, in um, computer science and so on, in some cases the memory can't go directly to the CPU. But in basic terms, right now, because I don't want to say depend upon it, um, in order for the CPU to get instructions, it looks to the RAM to get the instructions. Because most time, like 99% of the time, instructions are stored inside of the RAM. Are we clear on everything so far? Good. So that's the definition there. Now, we, um, a computer, does it need to be connected to any network, the internet, in order to function? No. no. Does not need to be connected to the internet. But today, most of our services come from the internet, right? We email, the online game, the video conversation, they come from the internet. So when you connect to the internet, you get more features. You get more usability, but you don't need to be connected to a network in order for the computer to work. It can be standalone. That's what we call standalone. It's by itself. It's standing alone. Now, your computer has um, a cycle. Just like how there's a water cycle, your computer has a cycle. With this cycle now, any computer follows this cycle. If you look at the device and you see it is carrying out this cycle here, you can see it is a computer because all computers follow this cycle here. So the first step of the cycle is to input data. What is input? Basically means the computer is accepting data. You're getting data. Um, the computer is getting data. You're putting data into the computer. However you want to phrase it, the fact is, data is going into the computer, right? So however it gets into the computer, that is called input. But you gotta be careful, flash drive, where you're transferring data, yes, the data going in, as we get into this, yes, the data going in, but it's not input. It's functioning as input, because the data is transferring in. But what's the main functionality of the flash drive? The store. So every hardware device, has a category and it falls under main category. So when we say input, we basically mean that a device is used specifically for entering data. What's some examples? Mouse, keyboard, touch screen, microphone, a gamepad, TV remote, joystick, um, a trackpad, um, a trackball, anything that gets data, the main purpose of it to get data, we call that input, and we call that device an input device. Good. Now, manipulating data. The second, um, the second step of our cycle, manipulating data. Now when you put the instructions, so say the input is like putting instructions. When you put this instruction into the uh, computer now, it has to process it. It has to try to understand it. What do you want to do with this data? So you press a key on the keyboard. What do you want from this key? You want a letter up here. You want the print screen to be carried out. You want the share screen to be carried out. What do you want? So that is called processing. So if you go back to the, um, the same diagram, it's like you press a key, the instruction gets sent into the computer, and then the CPU now is going to process it. So see how it leads back to the definition? 
the instruction goes in, it can go to the RAM, go to the CPU, and the CPU now is going to process it. So the third step now is when it finished processing, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta see somehow. Something gotta tell you that it finished processing it. And that's what we call output. That's going to show what it had processed. So if you input two plus three, the computer's gonna process that at two plus three, that's five. How will you know now that the answer is five? You're gonna get the output. You're gonna see the result is five. So what are some, and we call those output devices. What are some output devices? Monitor, printer. Monitor, printer, speaker, Monitor. plotter, projector. So anything that gets data, that gets the process data, the instruction, the, um, the information out of the computer that's showing you some form of data, that is output. What about the lights on the traffic lights? That's output. The lights on the traffic light is output. Um, the display on your microwave. Output. The keypad on your uh, microwave. Input. Um, what else? If you got a clock, a digital clock, and you see in the, um, the time. Output. So anything that's giving you data, that's output. And once its main purpose once again, is to give you um, output. <laughs> um, they, they gotta walk for um, labor, they are, or child labor, something like that. <laughs> yeah. So um um so there's a, those are the four um. Those three steps are the main steps of the cycle. Um, input, you process, and you output. Now the final step. I think it takes a long. Our IPOS, our IPOS cycle. So, IPOS, the name implies each of the four steps, right? I for input, P for processing, O for output, S for story. In the same order that the cycle is actually carrying out the action, right? Now the final st um, step of the cycle is storage. Storage is not always necessary. So, you say for instance, um, you were, um, like when you were doing the SBA, um, you were writing a program and you enter some numbers to do your calculation in the program, but, and it give you the output. You put in two plus two, you calculate the tax, you calculate the VAT and so on, but did you store that result afterward? No, you didn't store the result. So you enter the, um, the value, morning. you enter the value, right? Enter the program. You, it process the prog it process the, um, the entry. It gives you the output on the screen, but we never store the data. We never stored what was the calculation. So storage is not always necessary. But the final step of the cycle is to store the data. And how do we store data? Hmm? <laughs> On our storage devices. 
So this is where our storage devices come into play. Our storage device is where we're going to store our data. Good. So that cycle there, remember the four step, input, output, processing, and storage. Next, components of a computer. Now, a computer is not only a desktop, because remember it follows that IPOS cycle, right? So your phone follows that cycle also. Thus, your phone is a computer. The traffic light follows that cycle. Hence, it is a computer. So, what's the input for a traffic light? So, good. Good question there. Now, what is the input for a traffic light? Not all computers are developed the same. Not all computers need a person to give an input. Because remember, the input is the instruction. The input is the instruction. What's the instruction? No. General, what's the instruction for a computer? What gives instruction to a computer? The program. The software gives instruction. So, the, for example, the traffic lights, you don't need to go and type into the computer every time it needs to work. Why? Because the traffic light system has the computer program already on the device. So, the program is already installed. It's running all the time, basically looping all the time. We can't turn it off over here, Hatia. Come over the side. Or just move down to the end there. And I'm hot over here. Behind the low system. Yeah. No. Temperature. Yes, either way. Good. We have different types of computers. The traffic light system is what is called an embedded system an embedded system it doesn't look like a normal computer an embedded system can be in any form or size like for example a smartwatch how many of you got a smartwatch what? none of you yeah. a smartwatch oh, yeah. apple watch yeah. Yeah. samsung watch good so that's an embedded system also the um computer inside of your fridge the computer inside the microwave Oh, smart yeah, yeah, smart smart yeah. So that there is called an embedded computer. So your washing machine. Even your washing machine. Yeah. Yeah, but function um could be considered an embedded system also. Um good. So but the fact is that what I'm busy. Come quickly. Good. So not all computers not all computers need to be the same. Like for example, look at your desktop and your on your laptop. Are they the same? Both of them got the mouse? One I got trackpad, one I got a mouse, right? The monitor different, the keyboard different. So even the desktop and your laptop is not the same. Similarly, um, an embedded system doesn't look the same like a normal laptop, doesn't look the same like a normal desktop, but it still functions the same way. It still operates following that IPOS cycle. So any device that follows that IPOS cycle is a computer. Your PS5. Is it a computer? Yes. Yeah, your PS5 is a computer. Um, what else? And anything similar. Good. So, um, your smartphone, your tablet, your game consoles, those are all computers. Now, a computer has two basic components, hardware and software. Any computer that you look at and you see the parts of the computer, you can put it under one of two categories. You can say this is a hardware and this is a software. Clear? Good. Now when it comes to hardware, we can further break down the hardware into five categories. So anytime you look at the computer and you see a physical part of it, it will fall under one of these five categories here. So yes, it might have the functionality of another category, but it has a main category, like for example, the flash drive, right? 
So the main category of flash drive is a storage device, but it still can um, do your inputs. Good. So the first category is your CPU, Central Processing Unit, the brain of the computer. The name itself tells you it does processing, right? So this is the part of the definition that does the processing. Now the central processing unit has three parts. For basic IT, you only need to know two parts. But technically, it has three parts. The control unit and the ALU, the arithmetic and logic unit. The third part is called a register. The third part is called a register. So, but for basic IT, you only need to know those two parts. So, the control unit. The purpose of the control unit is to carry out the instruction and direct the flow of data. So, what sends the data to the RAM? What collects the data from the RAM? What sends the data to the hard drive? What sends the data to your monitor? What collects the data from your keyboard? The control unit. That directs all of that flow of data that um, carries out the instructions of that data. So if it says move the data, if it says whatever, that's the control unit. Now the ALU, arithmetic and logic, always think max. Always think max. Anything to do with calculation is the ALU. So, if it needs to do any um, arithmetic calculation, which is adding, subtracting, multiplying, all of those things, the ALU. If it needs to do any relation operation, which is more than, greater than, equal to, more than equal to, those are relation operations, right? So, the ALU carries that out. If it needs to do any logical operation, like doing AND gate, OR gate, and all of those things, that is the ALU. So the CU collecting the data, it can collect the two and the three, and it can collect the plus sign. But it's gonna send it over to the ALU and say, look, please calculate this to me, give me back the results, and I can send it to whoever needs it. Are we clear on that? Good. Now the input device basically inputs all devices that put data into the computer. The main functionality of the device is to get data into the computer. We already looked at examples, right? Trackpad, keyboard, and all those things. Output device gets data out to the computer. Um, printer, your screen, your speaker. Once it is the functionality is to get data out, output device. Are we following so far? Any questions? Memory. Memory is a temporary storage. Storage has two types temporary and permanent. We call them primary and secondary. Primary is temporary. Secondary is permanent. So memory, RAM, main memory, they are all temporary. So when you working on an assignment and you kick the card and the computer shut off and you turn on back the computer, you expect to see the assignment still? No. No. Because the instructions was stored inside of that memory, right? Remember this, um, this here. The instruction was stored in that memory. Anything you're working on on the computer, everything that you're seeing on the screen right now is in memory, is in RAM. That's why when you kick the card, it cuts off, everything is gone because the storage is temporary. Clear? Mm -hmm. memory. We, can, we can also call memory storage. Okay, it's still a form of storage. Um, so memory is temporary, that's holding the instructions and the data. So it also holds data. Like for example, you say add 2 plus 2, the memory is where you're going to store that 2 and the, um, the 3, right? Clear? So you said you said something between 2 and 3. Same, same difference, man. It's too <laughs> simple, number confuse you. <laughs> All right, good. Now the final category, storage. Now this here, you need to understand two terms. One, what is a storage media? And two, what is a storage device? A storage media refers to what is storing the data. 
your flash drive, your memory card, your hard drive, your SSD, your um, what else? Your CD, your DVD, your floppy disk. Yeah, so the physical media. Anything that's going to store your data, that is called the storage media. The storage device now is what is going to facilitate the transfer of the data. So, um, the CDs and DVDs, when you put them into the computer, don't you say you're putting them in a DVD drive? You're putting it into a CD drive? So anything that ends with the word drive is called a storage device because that facilitates the transfer of data. Now, this is kind of phasing out because um, flash drive doesn't have a flash drive drive and um, um, other devices don't have a drive. But um, in technicality, some persons would say that the drive is built onto the device and that's what's facilitating the transfer when you connect it or some would say the drive is on the computer but the basic understanding you need to have is that drive is what facilitates the transfer that's called a storage device and the media is what is storing the data are we clear enough? good now a peripheral device this is just another name considered like a nickname it's just another name to refer to hardware devices now a peripheral device is outside of the CPU but it is controlled by it if you look back at the diagram remember the CPU is a chip on the motherboard right so the, based on the definition Anything outside of this chip that is on this motherboard that is connected to your computer is called a peripheral device. So basically that's like any hardware that you got connected to your computer, we call it a peripheral device. Your mouse, your keyboard, your monitor, your projector, um, your printer, your trackpad, your trackball, your joystick, those are all called peripheral devices. Once it's outside of the CPU, connected to the computer, it is a peripheral device. Clear? Your webcam, peripheral device. Good. So that's it for hardware there now. Software now. Software is basically the instructions, as I mentioned already. The instructions that tell the computer what to do. You can get the best monitor, the best CPU, the best phone, but if you don't have software, that telling it what to do, it will not know what to do. It's like your brain. If your brain, if you don't give it any instructions, then you won't be able to function, right? It's like if you're going in a test and uh, you, do, you don't know what to tell your brain to do, how to add this thing, or what to write in the paper, your brain won't know what to do. <laughs> so, a computer program. A computer program is basically instructions, programs produced by programmers to create system and application software. Um, it's like a gray line here with the terms program, software, application, and all of these um, terms. So the general term is software and uh, it creates the computer program, the computer applications. Now, we have two types of software. We have the system software. As the name implies, this software is for the system. Whenever we hear the word system, we're referring to the computer system. We're referring to the entire computer. So, if we say computer system, that's the phone, that's the desktop, that's the laptop, that's the tablet. Computer system refers to the entire device. So, a system software is a software that is running or controlling the entire system. Now, we have two types of system software. We have the operating system and the utility software. The operating system is the, is the software, the main software, that is going to be controlling the computer. It's going to control the hardware, 
and all other software. So it's the main software. You got all the other software on the computer, but the system software, the operating system, is what controls all of them. So, what's some examples of system software? Windows, Windows, Linux. Remember, whenever you're given examples, you got to give the full name. Apple iOS. Apple iOS. That's what kind of operating system? Mobile. mobile operating system. So there's a desktop operating system and then there's a mobile operating system. Apple iOS, the full name, that is a mobile operating system. What else? A desktop operating system. Linux. Windows a desktop Windows. operating system. Windows 11. Microsoft Windows 11. Microsoft Windows 10. Uh, huh? Linux. Chrome OS. Or you can even say Google Chrome OS. Kali Linux. Kali Linux. Google Android. Huh? Google Android. Um, Fire OS. Harmony OS. Oxygen OS. No, but there is such an adoption. Yeah. So important to know. Well, the main the main desktop operating system you need to remember is Microsoft Windows and all the variations. Please remember, there's no uh, Microsoft Windows nine. Um, there's seven, eight, eight point one, ten, eleven, Vista, XP, um, and so on. Yeah. No, just remember some of the variations. Yeah, Windows 1. And again, home and professional. Yeah, Windows 1.0? No. Just Windows. No, you got, um, yes, you got some with a few numbers. Did I just got Windows Vista or something? No, the very first one. You got some with a few numbers. Either way, um, the main desktop operating systems you need to know, Microsoft Windows, Unix, Linux, and Mac OS. Those are the four main ones you need to know for um, desktop. Unix. Unix. UNIX, LUNIX, and Mac OS, Apple Mac OS. Those are the four main desktop. For mobile, you have the um, Apple iOS, uh, Google Android, um, and then the off brand ones that's the unpopular ones Chrome OS, um, Harmony OS, Oxygen OS, and so on. But the, you would say the, mo the most popular mobile is ones is um, Apple iOS and Google um, Android, right? and the variations of them. So, the purpose of all of the, the, sys, the operating system is to control the hardware and the software. Without it, it will not work, right? If you're, you got to your phone, the Apple iOS does not start up, can you use your phone? No. No. The software does not start up, you cannot use your phone. So that's how important the operating system is. Now the utility software, it's a utility something you use. It is used to maintain, protect, support the operating system. It's like they're working hand in hand. Think of the operating system like the HM or the CEO of a company and the utility is everybody else who's going to be supporting the CEO, supporting this HM. So what are some of the functionality? Protect, maintain, support, and so on. What are some examples? Um, protecting against viruses. Um, making copies of a file, but just basically backing up. Recovering files when they're deleted. Um, recovering a system when the system crash. Recovering data. So anything that supports the operating system, ensure it functions properly. That when it fails, bring it back up. That is called a utility software. Are we clear so far? Yes. Any questions? Um, so what are examples of um, utility software that protects against viruses? Huh? Antivirus. Well, what are examples? Avas, McAfee, AVG, Norton, and so on. Yeah, yeah they will come. <laughs> um, examples of um, software that do backing up. They got um, I think one name file recovery. Um, we got Ease Us. 
Um, you got CC file recovery. Um, yeah, but I don't know if they might give you file recovery software because those are um, more difficult to uh, remember. Good. Um, But think of it this way, think of it this way. What software do you use to back up your data? Being built, hmm? being built up like Windows Word. Oh, oh, good OneDrive. Exactly. That could be used to back up your data. Your OneDrive, your oh. Google Drive. Um, oh, cloud. It's cloud storage, but it can also be used to back up your data. Um, your Google Photos. Um, I I I iPhone has anything like that, Google Photos, cloud storage. I I good. So that's um use can be used to back it up also. Um good. So the next category of software is called application software. It's called an application because it's carrying out a specific task. It's it has an application. Um it's doing one particular task. So your word processor, your database, the uh, um the software that you use to create your program, those are all application software. Your game VLC, Excel, those are all application software. They, you're carrying out a specific task. It's not, you could think of it this way. It's not needed for the system to run. So once it's not needed for the system to run, once it's not supporting the system, it's an application software. Good, so we know the difference between all the software. Okay. Going back. A software that is used to carry out a specific task. Excel. No, Max. Sir, no, sir, you need full words, sir. What? Oh. Yeah, that's that's what I'm about to say. Microsoft or um, Excel. Microsoft Office. Yes. Microsoft Office is a package. Yeah, but yeah. still, but you know, it's not individual thing. But I know the application. <laughs> software that are grouped together are called what? Integrated software. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, software that are grouped together in a package like Microsoft Access, they're called integrated software. Because they're grouped together as one. Yes. But, uh, yes. yeah, they will. <laughs> yeah, because those questions always come. I'm telling you, everything that's basic about IT always come. Good. Um, we studied IT, but what is IT? IT is basically um, the studying hardware, studying software as to how we can access data. Retrieve data, convert data, store data, organize data, manipulate data, present data, anything to do with data, anything to do with information. That is the study of information technology. Now, communication technology, that deals with anything that is used to communicate the data. So it describes communi telecommunications equipment. So your phone, fax machine, scanner, modem, the computer, anything that is going to transfer the data, that's going to help you to communicate the data, that is called communication technology. Now if you notice, these are two separate terms, right? Information technology, communication technology. I'm sure you guys heard of ICT. So that's where we combine the two together now. So ICT is the combination of these two terms here, information and communication technology. So IT doesn't focus so much on communicating the information. So that's why they integrated it into um, forming ICT. So now we can get the transferring of this data after we finish creating it and presenting it. Are we clear so far? Yes. Good. All right, so the first category of um, hardware is input devices. Now we know input basically means to put data into the computer. Now the main thing you need to know about input devices is that there are two types. We have manual input device and direct data entry devices. So any input device will fall under one of these two categories, manual input, or direct data entry. When you hear the word manual, what comes to mind? You got to do something yourself, right? Like manual labor. So you got to do something yourself. 
So any device that you have to put in all of the data, that is a manual input device. So your keyboard, good example, anything else? The touch screen, yes, because you got to still put in all the data, right? So keyboard, keypad, mouse, um, document scanner, your microphone, a digitizer. A digitizer, important to note, is a device that converts drawings and images into data. It digitizes the data. So you get analog data and it converts it into digital data. So when you take a picture with your phone, it takes the real world data, which is analog, and converts it into digital data in your phone. When you, um, y'all know what's a graphics tablet, right? A drawing tablet, right? So that there is a digitizer also. It takes the drawing that you're gonna make, digitizes it, and puts it into the computer. So examples of digitizers are digital cameras, um, a webcam, um, and a graphics tablet. Where is that? And a graphics tablet. So those are all digitizers, converting um, analog data basically into digital data. Um, so we're still on manual input device, keyboard, keypad, um, your mouse, um, let me see. Uh, we know it's a keypad, do we? Basically, this, um, these row of keys here, at the end of this keyboard, that's what we call the keypad. Some uh, companies, they would buy that individually because especially like for accounting, um, it's just numbers a person gotta enter. So they just use this keypad to enter the numbers. Um, the full keyboard is all of the keys. Now we have what is called a special keyboard. A special keyboard is a keyboard that is different from what we are accustomed to. So we got a regular keyboard with the keys that you're seeing right in front of you. But a special keyboard is different from what you are accustomed to. A keyboard is basically something that has keys and when you press on it instructions are sent into the computer now a special keyboard is a device that has keys but it's different from the regular keyboard what the, what device it's because of um you want it to be designed that way so what device can you think of is like that it's like a keyboard but it's different from a keyboard the little chair ties with the person. What about the um the AC remote? The AC remote is considered a special keyboard. Any device that basically has buttons on it, any device that basically has buttons on it, is called a special keyboard because it allows you to do the input like a regular keyboard, but the layout is different. The key, the TV remote. The gaming control, the calculator, those are special keyboards. Now a mouse. We know a mouse is when you drag it, it moves the cursor, right? Now we got the mechanical mouse, which, I, which used to have um, a ball inside of it, right? So the mechanical mouse used to have a ball inside of it like this here and the ball would roll and that's how it moved the cursor on the screen today we have the optical mouse which uses the laser yeah so we, we see the difference here mechanical on the left with the ball right hand we have the optical mouse which uses light which is basically a laser and then we have a wireless mouse. So we know what's wireless, right? Where it doesn't need that cable. So those are the types of mouses, mouse, mice we have. Um, a document scanner. Um, notice the term, a document scanner, because we have different types of scanners. So a document scanner is the regular scanner that you have. So like if you have a printer, and it has a, a bed on top of it, we call that the flat bed. 
and you put the document on top of you scan the document that's what we call a document scanner because it's the purpose is to scan documents the microphone is basically when you speak converts your um, audio signals into digital signals transfer it to the computer digitizer as mentioned converts your analog data which is your drawings um, your writings and so on images into digital data so a webcam a camera graphics tablet and so on touch sensitive devices they're sensitive to touch when you touch them something happens so your touch screen that is a touch sensitive device your phone has one um, the ATM machine has one some laptops have one and so on your trackpad your, or your touchpad is also a touch sensitive device anything you, um, you touch and it um, carry out some sort of action which functions as input that is called a touch sensitive device pointing device now a pointing device is what allows you to point so the mouse which allows you to move a cursor the trackpad also which allows you to move the cursor a stylus which allows you to point in the touch pad, uh, touch screen and uh, and um for a projector. Huh? The, laser projector. the laser for a projector um, and then in the past we used to have what is called a light pen a pen with a light basically but so this here is a light pen as you see on the right hand there so these computers did not have a mouse they did not have a cursor the pen with the light is what indicated where the cursor would move and go that's how they were pointing yeah huh? what? no what we're using today is called a stylus the stylus basically replaced the light pen next we have remote control devices this is basically a TV remote your alarm remote um, any basically any bit um, basically any report all right good morning biometric devices these are basically devices that scans your body parts um, that it, that are unique unique body parts so what are the unique body parts fingerprints iris the face device um, the entire palm palm yeah. which is fingerprint so face iris voice yeah um, some persons don't consider voices biometric yeah easy to replicate and then your voices change I remember you're nervous your voice change when you're happy your voice change and so on good so those are all of the um, manual data entry you gotta manually put in the data right everybody clear any questions the next type of data the next type of device all right the next type of um, input device is direct data entry what this does now it allows you to automatically enter your data you got a group of data and it automatically enters it for you. So yes, you're still putting in the data, but it must automatically puts in a lot of data for you. So a group of data. So for example, a barcode reader. A barcode has information on it. Anybody know what information on a barcode? Numbers? No, like what information is on the barcode? Prices. No, that's important to remember. Price is not in a barcode. Permanent, permanent information is in a barcode. Huh? The item number, the um, which is the ID, the manufacturer, and any other such information. Huh? Any other such information is stored in the barcode. Why? Because those information are basically permanent. They can remain the same for a good while. But prices can change often, so that's going to be on the computer. So, um, when you scan this barcode, all the information for that item goes into the system. You, you don't have to type out the name of the item, what the item look like, and anything else. 
so it automatically puts in that data. Are we clear? Now this device is also called a barcode reader or a barcode scanner. So you see why we, uh, we call that um, device a document scanner? Now we have different scanners. Now, um, the barcode reader is used with a system called the point of sale system or the electronic point of sale system. A point of sale system is basically a system that a supermarket, a business would use because it keeps track of the item, keeps track of the cost, keeps track of the quantity, um, it is linked to um, the inventory so that when you sell the item, it, um, it, um, it documents that 30 items, 29 items, 28 items is now in the inventory. So the system will now know that I need to order more items. Um, so the, the discount, the VAT, all the information is going to be on this point of sale system. So when you scan the item, the ID of the item goes in. The system now has all of the necessary information for it. And that's how it, when you go to the supermarket, all you see is the items flying across the um, counter. Good. Next we have what's called a smart card. A smart card is basically um, a device that is going to store data. Um, not store data, what am I saying? It's gonna be used to input data. So, for example, um, your bank card, the bounty card, your um, DSL card, those are all smart cards. Now, there's a difference. We have what is called the um, magnetic swipe card. Where is that? Yeah. We have what is called the magnetic swipe card and we have a smart card. Um, they're both, their functionality is the same, but the design is different. The magnetic swipe card is those cards where you see a, a black strip on it at the back of it. So the bounty card, the Republic Bank card, and so on. They got a black strip at the back of it, which is a magnetic strip. That's what we call the magnetic swipe card. It has information inside of it. And when you swipe it, whenever you do whatever it, it transfers that information. But if you notice why Dustin said, has information inside of it. So that means it's kind of functioning like a storage device because it's storing a small amount of data. But the main functionality is to transfer so data. Is, yeah, because it can corrupt the data inside of it. So anything that's storing data magnetically, you do not put a magnet next to it because it can't corrupt the data. Yeah. Or, is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I corrupt it. Mm, corrupt the data inside of it. So, the magnetic swipe card is what has that bar on it. Now, the smart card is going to have gold contacts on it. So, for example, your SIM. Your SIM is a smart card. Now, some cards in the U.S. has... Um, the banking cards have a gold contact on it and that's what they use to transfer the data your sim card has a similar representation it's also called a smart card yeah the smart card is more efficient it's more faster it's um it actually stores more data than the magnetic swipe card so that's why um it's used more because it stores more data yeah Once you see the, the black stripe, that's a uh, magnetic stripe. I think um, I think they got it to the back. Yeah, to that there. The man of the class. Yes, sir. Good. So remember, um, they're used to transfer data, and there's a difference between swipe and um, smart card. The smart card is basically better. It stores more data. Um, the other difference between the two is that a magnetic swipe card needs a connection to the bank, needs a connection to the service. So it's like, um, you ever experience when your parents use the bank card and they got blackout, you can't use it? 
Yeah. If that ever happens, if they ever lose the connection to the bank, they can't use the card. Because the magnetic swipe card has to make a connection to the bank. And that's the only way you get it to work. Now the smart card has more information stored onto the card. So it doesn't need a connection to the bank. It can actually stay by itself and be able to use it. But obviously if you get that connection, it um, makes the um, transactions um, more smoother, more legible and so on. Good. Now the three big persons, the OMR, optical mark recognition. These are very simple terms. All you gotta remember is the term inside of it, mark. What is it doing? It's looking for a mark in the document. Remember it's input. So it's looking for a mark on the document and transferring the data. So like for example, lotto, your multiple choice questions, you made marks on them, right? So it's transferring that mark into the system. Huh? Huh? Can't spend? Why can't you spend? Because maybe the system doesn't recognize the pen. So that's why they would say use a certain type of pencil. Hmm? Hmm? Yeah. Good. So some of them might reflect back the lights. Good. Good. So that's why you got to use a certain shade of the pencil to block the light and all of that. So the technology. You got to use what um, would be suitable to it. Alright, good. Alright, alright. So, optical mark recognition looks for a mark, right? Optical character recognition looks for a character. So, it's scanning characters. It's like the document scanner. But the difference is that it is scanning the characters. The document scanner actually scans the entire document. You save it as a PDF, you save it as an image. Can you go and edit it after? No, no you can't edit it after. They are use some sort of special software to convert image to Word, PDF to Word, and so on. But you can't edit a, um, a document scanner right after. The optical character recognition is built for you to edit right after you scan the document. So that's why it's scanning the characters. So it scans the characters individually, puts it in the system, and you are now able to edit the document, apply the necessary formatting and so on. Now, the OMR and the OCR are used together as what I call a turnaround document. So for instance, um, like, like a coupon. The coupon might have the instructions on the one side and at the back you put your information, right? Now, say if it's like a flyer where you're applying for a job or something, they would have the information on one side. At the back you write out all the information and that now could be scanned into the system. That's called a turnaround document. Are we clear? Magnetic ink character recognition. As the name implies, it is scanning magnetic ink. What has the magnetic ink? A check. A check has this magnetic ink. What information is inside of it? It is going to have um, the branch code. Where is that? Yeah, good. So it's going to have the check number, the account number, the branch code. So information about the check, information that can identify the check, is going to be coded onto this check using that magnetic ink. Are we clear? Now, remember we're still on direct data entry. <coughs> Taking a group of data, automatically putting it into the system, right? Good. So we're at sensors now. We know sensors collect data and then put it into the system, right? And we have various sensors. We have temperature sensor, we have the weather sensors. Um, what other sensors do we have? Um, what else? Infrared sensor. Um, what other sensors do we have? The sensors, uh, motion sensor. Huh? 
heart rate sensor. So basically, any form of sensor. Huh? I'm just going just to close. Very good. Huh? Argo. So, um, we have what is called MIDI. Now, this is what this one is important to remember because I usually see this one here. Musical instrument digital interface. It's a type of sensor that is used with instruments. So, when you play a guitar, you play a drum, this is what is going to be used to sense the data, basically, and transfer it into the computer. So, you connect your instrument to a MIDI, and that's what transfers the, um, the sound into the computer for you to record it, edit it, and so on. All right, um, we're not going to go through that because that's basically a summarization. Um, MIDI, smart card, OMR, OCR, um, electronic point of sale, optical character, barcode, voice recognition system, that's input, right? That's the system you speak, accept the data, carry out instruction, right? Graphic tablet, scanner, touch screen, joystick. Everybody knows the joystick? So this here is a joystick. Yeah. So basically anything that looks like this here, that has a um, six axis. That. All right. Go for five minutes. Break quickly. Five. Yeah, five minutes. Ten twenty.